In this series, we are letting Reactor meet Stream Deck Plus. And that means we are doing a lot of complex graphics. I just couldn't help myself because it's so powerful what we can do inside Reactor when we have graphical devices like Stream Decks or Frameshot Pro from Skahoy, basically any of our panels. I mean, you know, we tend to sprinkle our controllers with small OLED displays. They are typically white text, super crisp and very, very nice uh, rendition of text and graphics on these. They are monochrome most of the time, and that's exactly what you need for clear text representation. And it makes our controllers super flexible so that you can program them for anything. So our controllers is like a very advanced and specific stream decks in a sense. And um, then to all this power that these controllers are giving you needs a powerful panel management software. This is what Reactor is. And in Reactor, we have this probably the, I don't know if it's the world's most advanced layering engine for a panel management system, but hey, then again, how many panel management systems exist? So uh, Reactor is this kind of system that will make any of your Skahoy controllers shine. And hey, why not also make it shine on a Stream Deck? So this is why we have that. We have our X key controllers. We have legacy Skahoy products. That one, E21 TVS, that's also compatible. But today we're working with the Stream Deck Plus, which is one of the newer Stream Decks. And uh, we hacked that ourselves. So um, thanks to us for um, making this work. <laughs> okay, so next thing that is in this series is basically this field. We are going to see a way we can record presets on a PVC camera. And in this project, we already have a connection to an ATEM Mini. This is the homepage of Reactor where we have a connection to the Blue Pill. The Blue Pill is the device that the Stream Deck is connected to. And then we also have the Stream Deck itself, which is uh, driven by the Blue Pill and made available as a raw panel device using the X Panel Stream Deck package, which is out here in the package manager running down here and providing converting the Stream Deck to a network device. Okay. Uh, watch the previous episodes if, if you want details about that. But the Panasonic camera you're seeing right there is next target for our little configuration um, uh, test here. Now, the um, the way that I have dealt with the, um, uh, the, the, the pairs of encoders and the displays so far is that I've given a layer to each one of them. And for good reason, because we saw with the transition that we want to have a master behavior with an addition to the step change master behavior, which is just, you know, cycle circulating within a the known range of options for a variable or a device call parameter. And, um, and it was useful to have that on a transition layer because we only expect to use it there, uh, especially because it was linked to the variable called stack. And up here on the volume control, we have the syscourse mode that was a, a variable normally inside a um, the uh, master behavior of step change long range, it is found inside of that behavior and used internally in that. But if I draw it out onto the layer, then I can also use it on the display, um, this two behavior that is driving the display right here. Okay, you may understand some of that if you have seen the previous episode. So what I'm gonna do now is to do even more of this uh, half-baked stuff. So this is the configuration of the final project. And I'm just gonna copy this layer of this configuration. And that is preset recall. And it has a lot of stuff inside, like it has the behaviors for display three and then coda three. So these two, I'll just uh, bring these out here. Um, and uh, wait, I'll simply go down here on edit raw and then I'll paste it in down here. Um, phew, let me see, I need to find the layer stack. So it kind of looks a bit the same. I'll just paste it in here, see if the comma is correct. It looks like it. Thank you. Let's move over to the config tab once again and see if this works as expected. And I have a reason to think that it may not. Ha, yes. And that is because I just copied something that was defining display three and encoder three, disp three and encoder three behaviors. And those are not yet mapped to elements in the key map. See, the key map is one that, because the key map is what allows us to use names or aliases or keys for the behaviors we define, like encoder three, which is defined up here, and um, then map it to a numbered component on the panel. So on any of our panels, buttons, faders, they have numbers, 
and that is what you see here. Panel number one, number nine, for instance. This is where we map encoder number one. So this whole map actually gets created as we are using the UI to, to point to a uh, such an element. Like if I do this create behavior, uh, let's just do that, create behavior, it would say, hey, P2.17 is actually um, uh, uh, display number three. Now, this this map was in my original file here, so let's just take that. Maybe we we'll just take this HVC key map that we defined here. So encoder number three is um, P111, and display number three was P1.17. So this whole key map, we'll just copy that over because it includes also the the things that we have not created yet, which would be display three and four. So we'll just quickly go here, edit this. And um, if I hold down shift and I click this one, it compresses everything. And then I can expand this one just to see. And then I'll substitute this with my longer list here, save current file. As I'm going back, I would now see that I have stuff going on here. So what we'll do now, I just copied this code in and uh, I will not build it up, obviously. I will rather go through what it does because you have seen me build it up a number of times now and I think you can handle to look at, analyze instead what it is we're actually doing inside of this layer. I think that was something, oh yeah, okay. Just be careful when you open up the JSON editor all the time, then you're creating new tabs and that easily becomes a little bit confusing. Okay, so now we just, we're down to the one tab that I want to have here. All right, perfect. Now, um, let's, let's look into this this one. First of all, the encoder, if we look at that one, just to show the JSON of this, the, um, yeah, that's actually a little story in its own. Maybe it would be, um, mm, no, wait, we have it working. So why don't we test it? Why don't we test it? Okay, so what I suggest we do is we go into the simulator here and we just do this to the side and then we take this um, the connection to the Panasonic camera side. We just reload this. So we should see the image from the camera. All right, perfect. Now uh, let's, um, let's just see here. Now we are currently uh, on preset number two. So if I press this button, then we will recall preset number two. Let's try that and we'll see the camera is moving somewhere stored as preset number two. Okay, perfect. If I press and hold, then usually what happens is that it is storing that preset. Now we're storing the preset in itself. So nothing is happening on the camera, but I'm grabbing the thumbnail for my, my display on the panel. And actually, voila, it is also on the Stream Deck Plus. Of course it is. So what you see in the simulator here is exactly the same as what I have over there on the panel. So uh, no worries about that. Let's move on and then just uh, find something else we can look at. Oh, there's a poster with all Skyhawk controllers. Wonderful. Let's just zoom a little bit in onto that one. And then let's go to the next uh, preset here. We press and hold to save that one. And it is storing. Oh, yeah. OK, there we go. Now, um, I don't know why I'd go back to number two. Press and hold. As always, during video recordings, you find some bugs in the code that you are changing. Actually, not in Rector's code, but in my configuration from my previous test. I don't know why I didn't find it, but the issue was that as I pressed and hold the button, it was also resetting the change of my preset numbers. So what I have right now, I can demonstrate how it works and I will also explain you um, then what I did to, to change this. Um, so basically now I can change between the presets. So this would correspond to rotating the encoder, okay? So I just go to, oh, preset number two, I wanna recall that and we see the Panasonic camera here in the background. So I just press it, short press and it's going to that preset, all right? So I can say, nah, okay, I wanna go over here. I click and it's going to that. This is what the operator can do by turning the knob. He'll change what preset thumbnail he's seeing. This is visual presets. I press and it goes to my poster of Skahoy controllers. Okay, so let's just, just for the sake of it, create a new position here. So we'll just zoom out a little bit and position the camera like that. All right, and then we'll just go to preset number four, which is not yet defined. Press and hold to store the preset. And we'll see this thumbnail is popping up. Now, if we go back here and we recall this one, 
All right, and then we can go to this one and we can recall this one and we go here. So this is visual presets. This is how it works on Frameshot Pros where you combine it with a PTC controller from Skyway. But here, we're using the same feature to actually get it onto your Stream Deck in this little window. And I find this is really charming. So let's look at how this is working. Now, let's move into the, uh, first of all, the uh, definition of how this encoder was set up. And um, uh, for this JSON code, I sort of, would prefer to see it in the bigger editor. So let me just see, uh, let me shut some of this down and then open this editor here. Um, if I hold down shift again, I see all this on these levels and have preset record here. So we have the um, HVC behaviors and we have encoder number three. Let's study this guy. Okay, so first of all, it's based on step change and the IO reference that it's changing is the preset number. So let's pull this out in a separate window, okay? So basically, preset number is the variable created right here. And I think that variable has a range between uh, one and, and 20. So just something that we decided. So um, the event handle is inside. And now notice that it's based on step change. And that means as um, by default, it will just, as you turn the knob, it's gonna change this value up and down preset number, it's just a variable that we defined in the system. Then I have added additional two uh, event handlers, one called recall, and that is a short press event handler. The reason why it's a short press one, and it's actually limited, it's only if you release the trigger within uh, 1000 milliseconds that it's going to recall the preset. So that's what this event preprocessor is using, uh, defining. It, you have to release it within 1000 milliseconds, otherwise you won't get a recall. And then if you go down, you see that we also have a store event handler, and if you go into that one, it is the opposite. Only if you hold it for 1000 milliseconds will it then give you a trigger and then it is going to store a preset. So that's what these event preprocessor definitions mean. And this is how you can program Reactor to do like um, timing based triggers in this case. It's a binary trigger and it is just going to call the device core, the Panasonic device core. Um, a preset store with the preset number that is defined from the variable and uh, based on the device index, by the way, which is one. So if you have only that one camera, then you would type in one here. Or if let's say that you actually had another variable that you used to uh, uh, control your Panasonic camera number, then you could also use that one in here. Uh, oh, what happened? Um, the same would be true for this one, the preset recall that is also this one. Now, the thing that I needed to change was actually this one. I had to add a override of the reset event handler from step change because inside of step change, there's a press and hold for 1000 millisecond event handler as well that will reset the value of the main IO reference, meaning the preset number. And that means it would reset that one back to like one or two. And this is why I got all my presets saved on, you know, on number one all the time. And therefore I needed to insert an overriding event handler and enable no inherit. And that basically means that this event handler is disabled. So far, so good with the encoder. So a little bit complex. I needed, to, when I coded this, I had to do a lot of copy paste from other things and fuse it together. So it was quite advanced, no doubt about that. So the more interesting part, I would say, would be the display. So once again, we have this display um, behavior here, and it is based on feedback default with display graphics inside a composition data source. It has shrink mode enabled. Once again, this is what makes sure that you don't have a black line uh, into the adjacent uh, graphic. And um, then inside the composition, let's see what we have here. We have, again, we are always dealing with layers here. And then probably the lower layer would be our image. And the image definition would be this um, inline image that has now an offset of minus 400 and is also left aligned. So this is expected. Uh, definitely. I mean, we are replicating like 200 kilobyte of image code every single time we have this line because of that background image. So it is not the most efficient configuration in the world, but it's actually functioning despite of that. Normally, we don't have configurations that are 1.6 megabytes big. Um, okay, so what else do we have here? We have um, a layer apparently that is uh, of the type graphics. Let's open this up completely and see what is inside of this one. Um, so we have some text and we have a rectangle. So what might that be? That sounds like text could be recalled preset up here and the rectangle would be the black one. Let's just check it out. 
the um, the black rectangle is probably the one underlaying the image and then the text on top would be recall preset here okay so correctly understood that is it um, if I if I we can just try to change this if we change this to uh, to 130 and uh, save uh, let me see can I do that now it would be wonderful if we had this in a sort of dual screen but um, ah, this is going to be fine this is just fine we don't even need that much so let's just press and then you see basically I'm changing now what is the width of this one uh, what was it 120 okay so that's nice I could also yeah manipulate many of these things but we have seen that a number of times before so let's look at what the layer on top of this guy what is that that layer is um oh it's defining a box we looked at that previously so um there's this show box on top that is a nice little feature that gives a black line around the boxes so we can see ha okay so that's the number the preset number that we are working with and we are basically boxing it in within this little red outlined area this is where this text is going to be rendered and the text has the variable preset number in it Okay, now, and, and then it has text size 100, and then it has this one, text auto size down. What do you think happens if you set that to false? It means that we have like a number that is rendered far too big, but because it's true, then it will automatically scale itself down so that it fits within the width of this box. I think the width only, not the height though. But um, let's, just, let's just see what happens if we... Um, if we uh, change, we can just do that on the encoder here. What happens if we change the preset to 10? Ah, you see that it's actually automatically scaling itself down as the string that we are trying to render within this box is becoming too big. So that's the effect of this one. Okay, that was nice, super nice. Let's just get this back to false so that we don't see this box anymore. Now let's close this one down and open the top layer up here. And the top layer, of course, is the thumbnail that we are dealing with. Once again, we have a box. So um, what would that be like? Probably exactly the same, like a little red outline that shows what is the area we are working inside. And that is, in fact, true. Type image. The uh, image definition is that it's a data source IO reference. We've been using data sources a number of times. We have used inline data source. So we just have a PNG file inside inline the configuration in this case. It is an IO reference that is referring to a device core parameter on the Panasonic camera called preset thumbnail. And we can't see the rest because our window is limited here. So uh, yeah, preset thumbnail reference, the preset number fitting fill. So this little box that we have defined is where the thumbnail coming from the device core is being stored for that uh, or being shown for that preset. Let's set this back to false. Okay, and save the current file so like that we move uh, sorry back and we can see these thumbnails okay so that is um, basically how this um, little beautiful rendition is done and the recall of presets on the encoder number three is also functioning um, I've is there something that I want to show you? Yeah, maybe just how could I know these parameters for the Panasonic PC camera once again? Um, of course, we have um, always you can go in here, you can pull up the parameter list and then um, preset. What did we use? Um, was it called? Oh, where am I? Ooh. Um, yeah, this is actually my complete source code of this whole project. So let me see. Inside of display number three, we're using this. It's called preset thumbnail. So what is this? If I search for this here, you can see that there are some Panasonic cameras that will have this preset thumbnail available to it. And uh, one of the models would be should be a um, AW UE 70. So it's it's covering a number of models here, 150, 100, UE, uh, UE 70 supports the thumbnails. There are some models that doesn't because these um, are probably, yeah, they don't have thumbnails that we can pull out of them, but for the others we can. All right, guys, so this is basically the third encoder on the Stream Deck Plus that we have now uh, been able to uh, expose and show how that works. Um, thanks for watching and um, See you in the next episode.